Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Abbasat Ala Eddin. You could call me Aladdin. Uh, how's it going, everybody? Today, I want to watch and um, so-called react to this video by Yasser Qadi. I know that it's about six years old, maybe seven years old at this point, but I think it's still relevant. And the reason why I want to comment on it is that, um, first of all, it popped up in my um, recommendations. But I remember having seen it a while back as a, um, I suppose you could call it a questioning Muslim. And I was curious about what he thinks or what, you know, what other Muslims are going through, because I, I still thought that was a very rare thing to happen, you know, apostatizing or having doubts about Islam. I was under the impression that only, you know, bad people leave Islam or it's because they're lazy or they mean to not want to believe anymore or they don't want to pray anymore or whatever, you know, version of that. So I haven't watched the whole thing in its entirety yet. Uh, I kind of skimmed through it. So I want to watch it again and see how, um, what I think about that, because I'm going to be looking at it as a previous Muslim. So as like, I'll, I'll put myself in the mindset of me as a Muslim who had que questions not me at the moment. I mean, I guess there's going to be a little bit of that too. <laughs> so I'm going to try to make this uh, short and sweet or as, as short as I can. And um, I will try not to interject too much. I might react like this uh, while he's talking so I don't interrupt too often. And um, yeah, there's a tangent that I might be interested in afterwards. We'll see if we have enough time. All right. Without further ado, um, let's begin. Oh, no audio? Ah, oh, man. Okay. 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 I, I think I got it this time. If you're still here, I appreciate you bearing with me. People question and doubt uh, their faith. Is it working? And become either agnostic or, 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 or atheist or whatnot. And the fact of the matter is that very few of us are really qualified to deal with this phenomenon. When you go and study Islam or when you, this is not, you're not trained to deal with the types of problems that our youth come up to me and other scholars with. And I want to just give some broad outlines. SubhanAllah, just recently I was discussing with somebody uh, who openly became murtad, but he was a very, uh, a very active person in his community. Uh, he was a youth counselor. He was a regular at the masjid. And then all of a sudden he just, you know, dropped out for a year. And then he announced that he's no longer a Muslim. Somebody connected me with this brother. We had a very long back and forth. And it was the standard questions. Why does Islam allow this? How could the Quran say this? Why did the Prophet do that? All of these questions about issues that he is finding ethically problematic about the Quran, about the Sunnah. I just got to pause for a second. You notice how he said these standard questions. That implies that these questions come up often. And if a question has a very um, definitive answer, I don't think it would need to come up often. I mean, it would come up in the minds of someone who, you know, just had the question, but then they'd find the answer and then it wouldn't be that much of an issue anymore. So that's not a good sign. About the seerah. So today I'm going to just very briefly touch about how do we understand this phenomenon? Realize, my dear brothers and sisters, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with three primarily, primary needs or faculties, if you like. The physical needs, the spiritual needs, and the intellectual needs. We have, number one, physical needs. And so, physical, we need to eat, we need to drink, we need air. If we, if we don't have these, these things, we're going to die. Number two, we also have spiritual needs. And these spiritual needs must also be fulfilled. If they are not fulfilled, then what happens? Many things. First and foremost, depression. Secondly, meaninglessness. Just living your life carpe diem for the moment. You just feel empty. You don't have a higher goal in life, right? And therefore, if you don't have a higher goal, you create a goal and you make it the highest goal. And that is why in our times there are so many causes that people are so passionate about. Things that were not that important 100, 500, 1,000 years ago. Whether it's ethical issues, environmental issues, animal issues. But people need a higher goal for which they want to dedicate their life to. It's in fact ingrained in us to do so. And Islam, of course, answers to that situation. Uh, okay, let's stop right here. So what he said about spiritual needs, it is, um, 
it's one of those statements that, I mean, you can't know definitively if that's correct or not. Some people don't have any spiritual needs. But what he said about um, the depression, for example, you feel empty inside without that spiritual uh, need uh, fulfilled. Here's something that they, he misidentifying something. Often or like often enough, people who leave religion or lose their so-called spiritual meaning, they will feel empty and depressed because there was something there. There was a meaning to life and then they found out it was a lie, more or less. So there's a lot of emotions there. Sometimes there's frustration. Sometimes there's denial, disbelief. Like, how could this happen to me? How could everybody in my life have been a liar? Obviously, people in your life aren't doing this on purpose to lie to you. Um, there might be little lies here and there. But uh, yeah, anyway, so that's what I have to comment on about the spirituality. And the reason why there's a lot of causes now that people hadn't thought of before or weren't uh, part of before Aside from the fact that they're not spending their energy and time and, you know, all that into um, the religious cause, for example, uh, we are not everybody, of course, unfortunately, but we as humans are living in a lot more luxury than we ever have in history. So we've got more free time. Uh, we've got more equity than before. And we're trying to make it even more and more equal, trying to make life a little better for everyone. And some people take on humanitarian causes. Some people take on um, causes that have to do with animals, not even just humans. So, yeah, that's one reason why uh, there's a higher frequency of these causes popping up now. Spiritual need. And then there's an intellectual need as well, that your intellect needs to be satisfied. Your, your curiosity needs to be met. So you have the physical, the spiritual, and the intellectual. Not everyone has an intellectual need. And Islam need, but comes yeah. with enough for all three of these things, that it tells you how to live your life physically, it tells you how to live your life spiritually, and it gives you the answers for the meaningful questions. Why am I here? What is the purpose of life? Why did, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, create me? Now the problem comes, the problem comes when we take one of these three functions and use them to trump the others, make it the end all and be all. And in particular, in our times, it's the issue of rationality. It's the issue of using our intellects or our brain to try the to issue. understand even the minutiae of Islam. And if we don't understand it, well, then we end up rejecting the entire religion of Islam. Now, am I saying that there are certain things in Islam that are irrational? No, I'm not saying this. Islam does not come with anything that is irrational. But it does come with things that are supra-rational, <laughs> i.e. rationality does not and cannot have a role to judge whether it's valid or not. It's beyond the scope of the intellect. Okay, Islam dude. does not come with anything that contradicts the intellect. But it comes with things that the intellect might not necessarily understand, even if it does not find illogical. So that sounds like it's illogical with extra steps. <laughs> Basically, he's saying if it seems illogical, it's supra uh, logical or whatever he said. Um, therefore, we can't understand <laughs> supra irrational, uh, super irrational, as uh, one of the commenters put it. That makes a lot more sense. Um, yeah, let's let's keep him talking. Is that clear? There are things beyond the scope of realm of reason of of of, of intellect of aql. We call it in Arabic, and Islam will tell you these things. And it is possible your mind will not fully comprehend, but Islam will never tell you something that goes against, that contradicts the mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with. And when you look at the questions that these young men and women and their... Wait, before he strawmans the questions, um, he's saying Islam never contradicts, you know, the mind's logic or rationality or whatever. But what about the... The people where that does happen, are you saying the only people with a sane mind are believers? Because I would argue, <laughs> no, let me not argue that. They're almost always young men and women, you know, 17, 18, 19, 20, when they're going through this crisis of faith up to the early 20s. When you look at the questions that these young men and women ask, they inevitably center around a, a core group of issues, all of which are modern all of which are emanating from Correct. within a particular cultural paradigm. In other words, the questions that people of our generation are asking never even occurred to the last generation or the generation before them That's or the true. generation before them all the way back to uh, the true. Prophet ﷺ and before. These are questions that modern society is 
positing questions about the existence of God, sexuality and orientation, yes. gender roles. Yes. These things did not exist. Society, yes. by and large, accepted these things as truths. And a hundred years from now, the questions that then those generations of Muslims will be asking will be completely unknown of, unthought of by the generations of our times. So, in... Wait, one second. Much like um, a lot of things in religion, there's a lot of truths to what he's saying, but then suddenly there's a something that hits you out of nowhere. So I keep nodding at the things that are correct. Like, yeah, somebody got the yes, yes, yes joke. Um, I keep nodding at things that are correct, but then all of a sudden it, it switches. So let's see. Instead of being so quick to question Islam, take a step back and be just as questioning of your own questions and where they're emanating from. Instead of just jumping at the Quran and saying... Okay, two things I want to say about that. Uh, first of all, yes, the reason why uh, we have questions today, the reason why we have a different mindset today is because, like I said before, we're always making progress, be it morally, be it um, technologically, be it in terms of the kind of luxuries that we enjoy as a species. Again, don't quote me and say there's a lot of poor people. I understand that. And I'm, I'm not saying that conditions are good for everybody. But I'm saying as a species, we have more free time that we're not spending foraging, farming, and past that, uh, whatever other uh, laboring jobs that we had to work. So we are given more time to ponder things, and we have more time to try to make things better for everybody and more equal. And the more we think, the more we find problems, like gender roles, for example, and sexuality and this and that. The reason why a lot of these things weren't questioned for a long time, as he is putting it, is because religion had a tight grasp on on that kind of uh, thinking so he, he's he's almost right let me let me go back a couple of seconds i kind of forgot what he last said so quick to question islam take a step back and be just as questioning of your own question okay this is not a bad point yes you should question your your questions and where they're coming from as he puts it um why you're asking these questions you you should you should question everything obviously you don't go paranoid but you should have a healthy amount of skepticism and questioning uh, but what he means to say and i'm saying this i'm not putting words in his mouth i have heard this from so many sheikhs they would eventually drive you to the point that they're trying to make which is the source of these questions is not curiosity or interest or whatever the source of these questions aside from you know shaitan is um, is because you want to leave Islam or it's because the bad people, the Islamophobes, the kafirs, they want you to leave Islam and that's the source of the question. But of course, that's not the source of the, the question. From. Instead of just jumping at the Quran and saying, why does the Quran say this? Take a step back before you get there and ask yourself, why am I asking this particular question and not another one that perhaps 500 or 1,000 years ago was at the forefront of uh, people's minds? And when you start contextualizing yourself, look, you and I, both of us, we are products of a particular civilization, of a particular code of conduct, ethics, morality, of a particular paradigm. We are living and born and raised in a particular context. And the questions that are being spoon like fed to us by the context that we live in, we also should be brave enough to challenge those questions. Why yeah. are we not brave enough to challenge those questions? We do. Even as we're brave enough to challenge the Quran. We do. Those questions will change. The Quran will remain, as we know, unchanged. And uh, Hold up, hold up, hold up. Isn't this the guy who said there's holes in the narratives about you know, the preservation of the Quran? And he just said it's unchanged? Okay, so the Quran, for those who don't know, I'm not going to delve into this topic right now, but it is not letter for letter the same exact Qur'an that the Prophet had recited or was revealed to him. There's Ahruf, there's Qira'at, there's different variants that sheikhs would argue aren't that different, so the meaning is the same, but sometimes the meaning of a verse is slightly changed or even more so changed by um, just a haraka or, or, a, or a harf, a letter being changed. So what he's doing here is something that I often see da'wah people do is selectively, I don't know if it's lying, I don't know if it's he sees it in his mind as the Qur'an is still preserved somehow, but he straight up just said the Qur'an never changed or never will change. And I believe him, I don't think it's going to change going forward because we already have the copies and you know we already know what it's uh, the preserved one right now is. So, back to it. 
the topic of, of intellect, the topic of the role of reason is a very detailed topic. And I mean, just FYI, uh, my, my PhD dissertation from, from Yale was about the role of reason and intellect in Islam. That was the whole dissertation was about uh, how, how to reconcile, or in particular, how Ibn Taymiyyah reconciled reason and revelation in Islam. And it's a very fascinating topic because Good point. That was in that thing. work, this great theologian, Ibn Taymiyyah, he actually critiques this notion that reason alone will always arrive at the truth. And he brings forth such beautiful examples. First and foremost, the impossibility of even defining what is reason, what is rational, what is intellectual. What might be intellectual for us was not intellectual a generation ago. What might be rational for us was not rational a hundred years ago. Rationality itself changes from society to time not to place. Not to that extent. And there, there is nothing that we can judge rationality by in and of itself. What he means to say is the unchanged, the ultimate truth is Islam and Quran and whatnot. So you can't trust anything. You can't trust your own rationality because it might change. What? That, that doesn't make any sense. That's like saying the weather is going to change tomorrow, so you can't trust it. Like, no. In fact, in our own lives... How many times have we undertaken a course of action thinking this is so logical, this is so reasonable, reasonable, this is so the correct decision. And the next day, the next week, the next month, the next year, we look back and we say, what a dumb decision I made. How could I have been thinking that? Isn't We ourselves experience this. That's me so how then can we take quote-unquote reason to be something above and beyond anything, always deriving ultimate truths from that? Now, does this mean, as I said, that Islam has nothing to do with reason? No, not at all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to think, to ponder. Can't have it both Allah ways. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran to make tafakkur, tadabbur, tadakkur of his signs. But if you look at the Quranic commands to think bite. and reflect, the Quran never challenges Allah's revelation. Yeah, no the shit. Quran never tells you challenge Allah's revelation. Rather, yeah. the Quran addresses non-Muslims and says, think, is Islam true or not? Think, is the Prophet true or not? Think, if this, is this book Isn't the Quran kind of from Allah or not? Once you come to the conclusion that the Quran is the book from Allah, that the Prophet Muhammad is a true prophet, that's where you use your mind. Once you admit and submit that the Quran is the, 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 the book from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you are not supposed to question each and every minutiae and law and wisdom. So he's saying, the Quran says question. They, they always start with that. They're like, oh, Islam says tafakkar, think and, and question, you know, all that stuff. But he said it himself. The Quran doesn't say uh, think about uh, the validity of Islam, basically. They don't think about the revelation. Only use your logic to, uh, to conclude that Islam is the truth. And once you get there, that's it. He said it himself. I don't understand how people aren't seeing how we will never this understand is. why we pray five times a day and not four or six times. There is no clear cut answer we can give. We will never format. understand why we perform wudu in a certain manner, why we have to do one ruku' and two sajdas in every rak'ah. It might not be something that is fully understood rationally, I don't but think neither that's why is it irrational. It. It's not against reason, it's there. You just submit. Now, if somebody were to say, I don't understand the wisdom in five. Well, tough luck. You've accepted the Quran. We're assuming you have accepted the Quran. You've accepted the Quran. You must accept it as a package deal. So, reason has a role and, and a place. And what is the role and place of reason? To guide you to the fact that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is a prophet. And the Quran is the book from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so the, the biggest straw man here I'm seeing is he seems to imply that the reason why people are leaving Islam is because we don't have a straight answer for why did Allah say you should pray five times instead of four or six? I mean, I'm pretty sure there are some pedantic people who are asking that, but that is not the question that comes to mind. There's so many questions. And if he means this is the supra-rational, um, this is the kind of thing that there's no like rationality that can answer, fine, I'm, I'm willing to let that go. I, I don't care about this at all. Uh, but he is kind of, he's straw manning. He seems to ignore all the bigger questions to say, uh, we're, we're looking at the minutia that don't matter. No, I'm looking at the things that do matter. 
Um, and I had one more thing to say, but I forgot. <laughs> Let's go back a second. Once you submit to that, Prophet ﷺ is a prophet. And the Quran yeah. is the only book use from it Allah to, to conclude that he's a Once prophet. Once you submit to that, then you accept the package deal. Oh, and, and one more thing. The reason why we pray five times is because the Prophet, went uh, when, when he went up to see Allah, he haggled with him uh, because the other prophets told him to, to reduce the, uh, the prayer, the, the amount of rak'at uh, a little bit. So it started off with 50 and then it went down to five because the Prophet haggled. Um, of course, uh, none of that really happened. And the Prophet was trying to basically flex on his followers and say, look what I did for you because I love you so much. It could have been worse. So just do the five. It's not that bad, right? <laughs> but um, it, it's funny that he brought up the the number of uh, rakahs when that, that is a funny story that came to mind. And if you look at the questions that these young men and women ask, they're always about fiqh issues of a relatively minor nature. Why does Islam allow this? Why does, uh, why does the Quran say that? And they're all things to do of a legal nature. They're not to do with the basics or the essence of theology. And we do not That's judge not the validity of a religion based upon the minutiae laws. We do. We don't judge a religion. How can as Islam well be true things. when we have to pray five times a day? That's not, That's not how we judge Islam. We judge Islam based on what? On theology. On purpose of life, on the fact that the Quran is a book from Allah, the miracle of the Quran, which is a separate topic. Once we've established that these things are true, we then accept the message as it is. We don't we don't have the luxury of tinkering with the message we do. itself. And therefore, if we rely too much on these questions and think that our mind itself will be able to answer it, then we are doomed to fail. Because I will never be able to explain to you every single detail of Islam. No one's right? asking about every and single detail. We have to realize that we should think about the questions themselves and where they're emanating from. See? And perhaps the questions Called themselves it. are flawed. And I want to give Called you just one simple example that the right always uses. Islamophobes the always right? use. Uh, and they make a very big deal of I it. Call this, and that is they I'm say, for example, oh, uh, your, your prophet astaghfirullah was, and they use a very vulgar word. Okay, now he's going to talk about the Aisha and whatnot. I just want to reiterate how this guy is ignoring all the legitimate questions and wants, wants us to, to, to believe that the reason why people leave Islam is because he doesn't have answers to pedantic things like uh, why do we pray um, five times instead of six or four? Uh, a, a reasonable question, for example, that is, is kind of, it's not really a, a mutation of this at all. It's, it's a lot more intricate than that, is asking why does Allah demand and on some level need prayer? You see how those two questions are different? He wants to convince you that the reason why people like myself left is because we're asking about numbers. But um, I didn't even start by questioning why is Allah so needy? But it is a question that's on my mind now that I definitely will ask and talk about. So please, like, at, at least be accurate. Uh, interested in young people. And I don't want to use the word out of respect for the process oh, because no. the age of Aisha was... Uh, young age. It was nine years old in the Sahih Bukhari hadith. Okay, I want to skip a little bit over this part because I will talk about this topic later and it just boils my blood when I see grown-ass men with beards talk about why it was okay at the time or it's okay now or how, you know, a girl who gets her period is mature and all this bull crap. So I'm just going to skip a little bit. This person, and this is a classic example, this question is emanating from a particular mind, coming from a particular culture, of a particular generation, and a particular time, and a particular place. The worst enemies of the Prophet ﷺ, who smeared him with everything imaginable, they couldn't even think of this as a flaw. Okay, now I, I want to answer that one. Um, Muslims always defend the Prophet's merit, saying, how come all of his em enemies trying any little thing on him they didn't criticize his marriage to a young girl because they didn't know it was wrong. <laughs> because it was normal at the time, as they always say. If they didn't know it was wrong, they're not going to hold it against them as something that is wrong if, if everybody's doing it. Or not necessarily everybody, but if it was that commonplace. And let me just, let me just quickly, like without getting into the topic, it doesn't matter how quickly the girl matured physically or if you want to claim mentally, which is absolute horse crap, her experiences in six years do not qualify her 
to like that's not enough of a life for her to live to have enough life experiences to decide whether she wants to marry a man or not because the reality is she didn't have a decision here um, at best she didn't cry every time she saw him and that's not exactly uh, what consent is especially in that context and whether it be six or nine no matter how much of a genius the kid is they have to have a life first because what is the life of, of a married woman especially married to the prophet like her life was gone by the time she, that, that she started to realize what uh, what reality was basically <laughs> Like she even has a hadith about how um, she remembers the prophet coming over to her house, which I, I don't want to get into this topic, but as a child. Why? Because cultures vary. Practices vary. And it's not just Islamic or Arab culture. The reality is 500, 1,000 years ago, the world over, people were marrying at Shut younger ages. Up, man. Uh, 2014, you know, Detroit, imagining a nine-year-old girl, and then back projecting, hey, I'm from one of them, Tennessee. You can marry people at 500 even. Why do they always keep listing U.S. states and they're like, in this U.S. state, this outdated law, uh, blah, blah, blah. Like, it's not a race to the bottom because if you want to compare yourself to the most backwards laws, the most outdated backwards laws in the U.S., then just, you know... <laughs> Why are they always pitting themselves against the U.S.? Even more so, Romeo and Juliet. When Romeo and Juliet was written, do you know the age of Romeo and Juliet in the Shakespeare's play? Romeo and Juliet are supposed to be 14 and 13 years old. And that's why they had 14 okay, and 13 okay. of his era, 14th country in the 1800s, early 1900s. Just shut so up. marriage is still much younger. I remember asking who like... And I was at the time 17, 18, so I couldn't imagine getting married at British India. We're not talking about, you know, a thousand my friends. We all got married at that age. And this is 1920s British India. We're not talking about, you know, a thousand years ago. So for us to be so gung-ho. So I, I kind of listened to this part before. He said that his grandma had married young and he was shocked at age 17. He asked her, he was 17, not her. He asked her uh, how, and she said, that's what everybody did. And he's like, see, it wasn't that long ago. Oh, so passionate. So, and of course, this leads us to the issue of how do we respond to these charges? And there are many hey. Muslims, they just don't understand. And they buckle under the pressure and they start, buckle. you know, figuring out, well, Aisha was actually 18. Very convenient because 18 is the age of marriage here. I'm pretty sure 100 years from now when the age is raised to 1920, all that automatically Aisha's age will miraculously rise up to 1920. That's not the way to answer these questions. Good. Aisha never complained. She was the happiest wife. Oh, shut the hell up, man. Okay, so where he's going with that is basically don't sugarcoat it. Don't lie about her being 18, which, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with that. Just be honest about what you believe so we, can, so we know exactly who you are. We know how you think. In the world. She loved the age. Just, a nine-year-old girl does not qualify. complex. The and then whole we talk have young is about coming Aisha. up to us. How could Islam allow X? Why does the Quran say Y? Take a step back and ask yourself, why am I asking this question? Where is this question emanating from? Perhaps my own understanding should be questioned before uh, questioning the Quran and Sunnah. No. Also realize that, as I said, Islam caters to more than just intellectual questions. Does it? Far more profound, Islam caters to our inner core spirituality. The and thing in you Arabic, can't define. The, fitra, the innate subconsciousness go. that Allah created us upon. We have inside of us some innate subconsciousness. Something that Allah put inside every human being. It's called the fitra. As our Prophet said, Every child is born upon the fitra. Every child has this fitra. What is the fitra? The fitra is a source of intuitive knowledge. It's not knowledge that is gained by society, taught to you, spoon-fed to you. You are born knowing certain facts. For example, right from wrong, morality from immorality. Every child knows. Every young man and woman knows. I am very confused right now. So we have innate morality? Isn't that what ex-Muslims have been saying for a while now, or at least a, a bunch of us? I thought Islam was the only source of morality. Of course, he's going to say that fitrah is instilled into you by God, and that's where the morality comes from, blah, blah, blah. But at least we've established it doesn't have to come from the religion directly. Like, whether you're Muslim or not, you're already born with it, allegedly. And about the fitrah thing, so Islam capitalizes on this idea of fitrah. So say... Um, the, the innate want to not uh, make someone else cry. Like a baby doesn't want another baby to cry. Um, that's just innate in us. They would say that's because of Allah. 
Um, and by the same logic also, uh, we're all born Muslim because it's, it's the same thing. It's associated. And also that's why birds know how to fly um, south in the winter, whatever it was. I, I'm, I'm confusing myself. Uh, I am not a book of science, just like the Quran. Um, yeah, what was I saying? Yeah, so they would say that the animals have this, this fitrah from Allah or this, this innate anything that, that is already in us. Islam will take credit for it. And unfortunately, if you're young or if you're gullible, you're going to see that and be like, oh, yeah, I do have that innate quality or that innate quality, which might just be biological. I do have that. Therefore, Islam is true. No, it just capitalized on something that already exists. That to be good is good and to be bad is bad. When you lie, when you cheat, when you steal, that's not good. They know it because it's in the fitrah. When you're kind to the poor, it's something ingrained in us. You feel good about it. And the fitrah also tells us that there is a God and that God is one and he is worthy of being worshipped. So the Muslim does not need to intellectually analyze each and every law in the Quran and Sunnah because his inner conscience is at ease that Islam is true. That inner conscience, the fitrah, will tell him this is a correct religion. And once the fitrah gives him this knowledge, then there should be an acceptance of the minutiae, of the, of the more tertiary laws. Now, again, I want to be very clear. I am not saying that Islam doesn't tell us to think. I am saying we don't base the validity on Islam based on the age of Aisha. Okay, you're... here's the thing. Even the whole Aisha debacle... That's not the one thing. It didn't even make me question because I didn't know about it because they don't teach us that stuff. A lot of Muslims, even our parents, might not even know about it. Um, but it, it's not just that. And it's not just the minutia or it has to do with uh, silly laws. It has to do with bigger questions than that. But why is he just focused on, on, on this point right here? Why is he is straw manning so hard? And, and he says, no, no, I'm not saying don't think. And then he says, don't think, basically. Is saying uh, you you can't think when it comes to anything except Islam is true. So just think within that circle, which for all intents and purposes, don't think at all. Based on why does a man allow this? Why relevant. does a woman have to cover? Why is inheritance this? These are laws, and you might not understand them. Now, by the way, there are ways to answer every question. Every single question that somebody asks, you could attempt an answer, but some attempt. of them are not going to be satisfying. Yes. And rather going down this infinite maze and loop and answering every question, take a step back and challenge your own understanding. Challenge your own paradigm before you challenge the Quran and the Sunnah. And the last point that I want to say, and my time is up here, is that if you meet such a person who is having some doubts and whatnot, always tell this person, look, there's one thing that we don't lose me and you, both of us. And that is to sincerely call out to the one who created you, to guide you, and I will do the same. <inaudible> that the power of dua, never underestimate it. That if you are in doubt, tell okay. this brother, this sister, if you're really in doubt, then continue to make sincere prayer. Because you're not going to lose anything. If you think there's no God, what do you lose by sincerely praying? And if there is a God, then clearly this God will hear you. And we have a very clear belief in our religion. Okay, so many things to unpack here. First of all, that's Pascal's wager. If you don't know it, look it up. But in short, it's basically this idea that what do you have to lose? If God is real, then you're going to go to heaven if you do the things that you're supposed to, as God said. If not, you've got nothing to lose. You've lived your life already. Oof. Okay, first of all, no. If you do follow religion, you're going to be restricted in many ways that not necessarily restricted for your own benefit, but just because of superstition and because God likes things a certain way and he's not here to tell us, he's just sending messengers. But also, which God? Am I supposed to follow every other God just in case one of them is true? So that's where this, this fallacy just falls on its face. And then he says it, he says, if you pray to God, basically, then if you pray sincerely, then it's going to be resolved. But we did pray sincerely. At least I can speak for myself. I prayed sincerely. I cried in Mecca when I was doing Hajj because I I was so frustrated with myself. I felt like something is wrong with me because I was praying to God. I was doing it. I was doing it from like I felt so bad that I was doing Hajj, which is a privilege because I, I lived in the in the country and thankfully my parents took me there. So it didn't cost me anything and it cost my parents a lot less than it would have cost 
people who don't live in Saudi Arabia and they save their whole life for it. And I, and I was squandering that. At least I felt that way. It's not that I was a bad Muslim before that point. I was just having these, these questions and I, and I felt like it's bad that I have these questions. It's bad that the answers aren't, aren't satisfactory. And because of people like him, they keep insinuating that if you don't like the answers, that the source is something nefarious. The source is something bad. Um, you just need to pray harder. And if you pray hard enough, if you're sincere, then God's going to fix what's in your heart and this, this and that and get the shaitan off your back. Um, w w that makes you feel guilty because when you pray and nothing happens because you're using your mind rather than just, you know, just praying, certain types of people, they just, it's not conscious that the answer doesn't satisfy me. It, it's not conscious that I, that the question keeps coming back even w when I'm praying. So damn you, Yasser Qadi, for instilling that guilt, you and everybody like you, for instilling that guilt and that suffering into so many uh, young people with questions and even older people as well. And that is... Oh, and, and last comment about that. If he basically said something like God will answer for sure. Let's listen. If you think there's no God, what do you lose by sin? Do and I will do the same. That the power of dua, never underestimate it. Okay. That if you are in doubt, tell this brother, this sister, if you're really in doubt, then continue to make sincere prayer because you're not going to lose anything. If you think there's no God, what do you lose by sincerely? Okay, I don't want to go back and try to find it. But basically, he said something about how, like, if, if you're sincere, it's just going to happen. You make dua, you're sincere, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be fixed. But God doesn't answer prayers that way. And when he doesn't, they say, well, it's because he's going to answer it in the afterlife or it's a test or whatever. No matter what happens, God either did it or didn't. And that was part of his plan. So you can't claim that if you pray, God's going to answer and it's going to fix your faith. And at the same time, claim that God doesn't answer all pray prayers and he's going to answer it in the, in the day, like after the day of judgment or whatever. So many pray. things. And if there is a God, then clearly this God will hear you. And we have a very clear belief in our religion. And that is, whoever wants to be guided will be guided. Allah That's does it. not play games. He Allah does. does not put traps for the one who is sincerely wants the Sirat al-Mustaqim. So if he this does. person is sincere, and I told this Thanks brother as well who I was the speaking with, and I still consider him a brother in humanity, and I pray that Allah guides him. I told this brother, we had a long back and forth. In the end, and I wasn't able to answer each and every question. I gave him the generics. In the end, I said, look, I am confident that if you are sincere, you will come back to the deen. And inshallah ta'ala, me and you will be praying together and giving lectures together one day, inshallah ta'ala. And if you are not sincere, then every single answer that I give you, you will find loopholes because for every why, there's a why not. And for every if, there's a but. And for every and, because there's an and. And there's an infinite loop over and over again. And there comes a point in time where you simply have to say, you know what? I know this man, the Prophet says him to be a prophet. Okay, so much to unpack here. Um, it is extremely condescending and kind of, you, you can't defend yourself against it when they say, um, and, and even in Islam, this main idea of what a kafir is, is a denying, lying disbeliever or someone who's so misled and so lost that they just don't know, don't know that they're wrong. So if you accept the answers, then you're sincere and you're a good person. If you don't, then it's because you're not sincere. You, you see how it's kind of self-fulfilling? Like if you, he's never going to ever accept that someone was sincere and they didn't like the answers because the answers are nonsensical. It's not because we're stubborn. It's because this idiot, like, I'm, I'm sorry to retort to uh, resort to, to calling names, but I feel very, very, um, it's not even anger. I'm just frustrated that he goes out and he has a huge audience and he's doing what, what happened to me, this, this kind of confusion to a lot of people. And the reason why I called him an idiot is because what came to my mind is his justification of marrying a child back then or not back then. That part is idiotic. There's no, there's no um, like walking on eggshells around that. I have no problem calling people idiots if they justify child marriage. But to get back to the point, what he's doing here, it seems very innocent, but it really isn't.
his lifestyle, his message, his teachings. I know the Quran. I oh, and he said um, the reason why we're supposed to like there for every if there's a but or whatever it may be. Um, that point is kind of true, yeah, and that's what philosophy is all about. I, I believe it's always think of of one side and then the other and eventually you're either going to reach a conclusion or if it's something that's not very consequential you can put it aside or you can reach a conclusion and just it, the problem is this is not just something that you can put aside this is your eternal fate or at least you believe so in your inside religion so the way he puts it like it's just um just stop questioning and then he says it's because i know this man to be the prophet but that's the whole point it's like they don't even think if you know, like, we don't know this man to be the prophet, the guy isn't here. And even the people around him, not everybody knew that he was a prophet. And he would say that's because they were deniers and liars and bad people and blah, blah, blah. But the reality is, it's because people want evidence that he's the prophet, right? And I don't care if there are stories about him splitting the moon, which is absolute horse crap, um, which he's going to say Allah covered it up so that NASA never finds it. Um, prove that he's a prophet. You can't say that we should put the questions aside as Muslims if we can't even verify that he's a prophet. And once we do, we could still have the questions pressing in our mind. I could 100% believe, and I did at the time, I believe that he's the prophet. I believe he's from God, but help me because I cannot control these questions that I have in my head. You can't sell me the nonsensical and tell me to put it aside because this guy has authority. I would. I would if, if, I, if I truly believe today that Muhammad is the prophet, and if Islam had such a tight grasp on my mind, I would be terrified not to follow in Muhammad's footsteps because I don't want to go to hell. That doesn't mean that it answers the questions. And it doesn't mean that the questions go away for the kind of people who think. I hear the Quran, and I know it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I speak this as a half of the Quran, as a believer in the Quran. Wallahi, I hear the Quran, and I know this is a book from Allah. Just I heard the Quran. I learned Talawa. I was memorizing it. I finished. I didn't finish the whole thing. Just because something sounds, I don't know, magical to you or sounds like a like it's pleasant to listen to, doesn't mean that it's from Allah. Just the way it moves me, the way the the, the resonance, the sound, so the emotional. words, and this book cannot be from a human being. That's all I need to know. I don't. I might not be able to answer every single. That's the summary shape, right here. But when I know the Quran is the book of Allah and the Prophet is the Prophet of Allah, then Alhamdulillah, I submit. After that, may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala guide me and you and all of us to that which He loves and is pleased with. Which is okay, now he's going to ramble a dua and stuff. So his answer is basically believe. <laughs> his answer is leave the questions aside and believe. But Habibi, that's the whole point. Did you not listen to any question that you heard? And that summarizes, like, th this guy isn't even the worst of them. There's a lot of sheikhs who would be um, a lot more hostile. Like, he doesn't seem hostile, but he's condescendingly, um, insidiously hostile in a way. But at, at the core of it, he's not listening to the questions. He's saying, if, it's, if it looks confusing, uh, first of all, uh, I'm going to interpret it as you're asking about the number of uh, prayers, because that's it. And... Um, if it looks confusing, just put it aside and believe in Allah because the Quran sounds good. He, he just said that's all I need because the Quran sounds like it's from Allah. What, what criteria is that? What criteria is that that it sounds like it's from Allah? Jazakumullahu khairan. Okay. Jazakumullah khairan. Now, uh, let's move on because I, I still have a little bit of juicy stuff to talk about. I don't know if there's a debu debriefing here uh, to be said. Does anyone in the comments want to um, say anything before I move on? Let's let's read some of the comments. So this person's saying, but the Quran is just bits and pieces from previous literature. The only interesting question is how it was put together over time and by whom. And that's the thing. I always get asked, then then who wrote the Quran? Muhammad was a, was a ummi. He couldn't write or read who wrote the Quran. Um Something to think about it here is, first of all, there's a hadith about Muhammad wanting to, uh, he asked for a pen and paper to write something on his deathbed so that we never get lost. And uh, Omar said no. I believe it was Omar ibn Khattab. He said, no, 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 you're, you're too old and you can't do it. So can he write or can't he write? But aside from that, there were a lot of poets at the time who couldn't write or read, but they could still do poetry because that's just how you know it was with the Arabs in that area. 
And it is interesting to ponder, you know, from a historical point of view, how did the Quran come to be? Uh, could it have been put together by the people after Muhammad? Like the Ahadith, for example, there's a lot of Ahadith that we, we don't know if he actually said that or not. Um, in fact, some people think that all the Ahadith are made up after, after him. Um, so that is an interesting question, but more from an, like, um, general, I guess, secular interest or uh, academic interest, if you want to put it that way, not um, just leaving it as it, it sounds good. So, so it's from Allah. Oof. Okay. Uh, let's see. It's funny how they claim he was known to be trustworthy, Sadiq al-Amin, but doesn't the Quran say something like, do they not call you a liar? Yeah, it's um, yeah, something, something on the opposite. They always say hey, even his enemies knew that he was a sadiq. I mean, they would call him the honest, uh, the trustworthy one. But the Quran says some people disbelieved. And with every prophet, apparently, not that these stories actually happen necessarily, with every prophet or every uh, acclaimed prophet, self-acclaimed prophet, people will not believe. And they take it to be some kind of prophecy. Like when Muhammad says things like, some people won't believe and those are the bad people. Well, of course, some people are not going to believe. Like even the, the vaccines right now, they're science, they're, they're proven, and there's a lot of people who don't believe. So that's not really some kind of uh, prophecy. Let's see. You understand because you are emotionally biased so that you'll be confrontationally biased. Wait, you're saying I don't understand or I do? I'm a little confused about that. Let's read some more. Uh, it's true because it feels like it's true if you thoroughly put your hopes up and I and I, ego and identity to it. Yep. I can't imagine, um, I, I can't imagine the pressure that's on someone like him to not take back anything he said, uh, especially, or even like with himself to reconsider his beliefs. Can you imagine going from uh, this kind of Dawa person who studied Islam for so long to questioning? I remember that he said he had some kind of faith crisis or whatever, but um, I, I think he's way past that now. He's, he's dug his, um, I don't know, he's dug it in his trench, I suppose. Can see the emotions in your eyes. Oh, you bet. You bet you can. Um, the guy was just rambling about emotions in the Quran sounding good and this and that. And then Muslims always would turn around and be like, but you're not thinking about Islam logically. Uh, you're thinking about it emotionally. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> it's not like people sit down, write a dissertation about Islam and then decide, and other religions, and then decide which religion to join. They join it because of how it feels to go to the masjid with their family, if, if it's a good experience, of how it is indoctrinated into them. Like literally the first moment you are born, um, a lot of Muslims would would uh, recite the, the adhan in, in your ear. Allahu Akbar is, is the first word that you hear. So how can you say that there's some logic behind this? And sometimes I do get emotional because humans have emotions. If you're expecting someone to sit right here and be like, Islam is false because if you look at verse blah 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 and verse blah blah blah, that's not me. I don't even I don't even bother to argue or debate is Islam true or not. It is such an obvious thing to me that it's not worth arguing. And Muslims seem to think that the default position is Islam is true. Now prove me wrong. No, prove Islam true first. So I get to be emotional because I am a human being and I have emotions to convey. And in this case, I don't think my emotions clouded my judgment. If anything, the emotions kept me biased towards Islam, not against it. The emotions are what kept me searching for the truth. As a Muslim, if, if I didn't have these emotions, if I wasn't so attached to Islam, I would have just noticed the first few absurd things and been like, yeah, screw this shit, I'm out. That's not how it happened. Anyway, moving on. So TLDR, Islam says not to question Allah. Only think when it benefits Islam. Islam sounds nice on paper um, to them, so some people follow it. Yeah, that's that's a great TLDR. I'm going to read a couple more comments, and then I'm going to get into the next mini topic. It, it, trust me, it might be interesting to you. Uh, let's see, any more comments? Hmm. <laughs> wish the fully comprehensive Quran told me to buy Facebook shares in the early 2000s. Yeah, see, people would, would see me reading this comment. Uh, some people would think, oh, this is actually how you think? You expect the Quran to spoon feed you everything in existence? And no, that's just a, that's just a joke. Uh, wait, is he going off on me? No, no, I am not. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry if I like misinterpreted uh, your, your question. It wasn't, or your statement, it wasn't about you. I was going on on a tangent about this whole emotion thing because... 
one of the, the things that I hear the most is you're too emotional when in fact, especially when I'm discussing things with, uh, with Muslims and belligerent Muslims, I, I seem to keep a, a cool compared to them. Like the guy was shouting louder than I was anyway. So moving on, I wanted to, um, dig into what is a shabha, like I said earlier. So I looked up the definition and then I came, um, came across some sheikhs talking about it, and then I came across this, uh, this hadith right here. So this hadith says, but between them, oh, okay, now let me go to the, uh, the longer version. Um, here. Al-halal or al-haram, okay. The, um, the, both legal and illegal things, halal and haram, are evident, are obvious. But, excuse me, but in between them, there are doubtful, suspicious things, shubahat. And most of the people have no knowledge about them, okay? So whoever saves himself from these suspicious things saves his religion and his honor. So if you, if you ponder these suspicious things too much, you might lose your religion, which is true, because that's, that's what happens when there are flaws. You think about them, you find them, and you conclude that this can't be from God. So don't do that. But also your honor. Why is it tied to your honor? And that is one way they retain people is through this emotional blackmail. And, you know, I say this as if, like, don't interpret this as if Muslims are doing it insidiously. It's just built into the religion. I don't know about the person who started it, if, if they intended this, but this is how the mechanism works right now. Even if the people doing it mean well, even if they're worried about you going to hell, it's that fear, it's that, uh, that mentality that... Anyway, moving on. Um, and whoever indulges in these suspicious things like a, is like a shepherd who grazes his animals near the private pastures of someone else. And at any moment, he is liable to get in. So he, he's liable to accidentally have his pasture um, like graze, sorry, have his animals graze in someone else's land. Oh, people, beware. Uh, beware. Every king has a, uh, a pasture. And the pasture of Allah on earth is his haram things. So don't accidentally walk into God's pasture because he doesn't like that. Get off my lawn. <laughs> okay, so um, I looked into, I was looking at this um, explanation of it, basically a sharh. And let's see, what, what was I? Yeah, so these two hadiths, they're very similar. Like a lot of the words are identical, but one is longer than the other. And let's see. There was another hadith that was slightly different, but I'll, I'll just put that aside for now. Let's presume uh, I was wrong. Um, no, th there it is. So there's another version of the same hadith that, that continues on. Um, it says, okay, and then it continues on. And that made me think, how many times do we see hadiths where one is missing some or it's slightly different? And what does that tell you about the transmission of hadith? How how could it be such a trustworthy method of transmission? And then we arrive at two different hadiths. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Am I not sharing the screen with you guys? I apologize. Let me share the, uh, the correct screen. All right, here we go. So the hadith I was talking about earlier is right here. You can pause and, and read it. This one right here. Anyway, so in the explanation... Um, yeah, so the explanation, it goes on and on and on and on and on, talking about, you know, what this shubuhat, uh, uh, why why you should avoid the shubuhat and so on. Nothing really except, basically, it's going to lead you to doubt. But of course, there was, there's some rambling, a lot of rambling about it's shaitan, shaitan, shaitan. So when com someone comes to you with, with a question, it's, that's my experience at least, every single person who I asked the question. By that, I mean sheikhs. Uh, there was a couple of faith counselors. There was even um, a, a convert who now was kind of preaching Islam. And they always, always end with the sources of the questions, though, that they, they might be the shaitan. The shaitan is in your ear. And it's insulting to people who think. Um, and if, if, if someone is not insulted by that, if, some, if someone actually believes it because they're still believing to some extent, then it is, is gaslighting. Imagine someone is, is asking you a very, very logical question and you tell them that's because there's an invisible little ghost on your shoulder that's whispering in your ear. So instead of giving them actual answers, you're telling them 
there's magic involved. There's spirits and devils and ooh. How do we take these people seriously? It's this is why people leave Islam. If you attempt to answer the question and you somehow trick them into into accepting an answer they they don't even have a chance to think about, they're more likely to stay for a little bit longer. But if you tell them it's because it's a devil, it's gonna work on the unfortunately more indoctrinated um, more indoctrinated people. But it's not really gonna make them good believers. Like when he was saying earlier. What do you have to lose if, if Allah isn't real? Just pray to him. Am I tricking Allah? What does my faith have to do with me doing uh, prayer just just in case? Like, what would scaring me and telling me that uh, the shaitan is whispering stuff in your ear, this is, uh, you know, it's going to make you go to hell. What would that do to make me believe more? Or it's going to do is try to scare me out of uh, not going to hell. Um, so it's not a great strategy at all. So, uh, about the Shibuhat, I can't remember what the uh, link was to this one. Sorry, give me one second. So, uh, yeah, so so you're supposed to obey. I can't remember, to be honest, what got me on this tangent, but I'm going to start from here anyway. This hadith, um, the Prophet says, I am leaving you upon a path of brightness whose night is like its day. No one will deviate from it after I am gone, but one who is doomed. I think it was that part. Uh, basically, after I'm gone... If you um, don't do what I say, you are doomed. That's at the core of most religions with a hell. Whomever among you, whoever among you lives will see great conflict. And that's one of those things that people might see as some kind of um, prophecy that, hey, the prophet predicted that people will be conflicted about this or, or fight about it. Yeah, they were already fighting about it while he was alive, as with every other thing in existence. And especially when you have a shaky uh, religion, of course, people are going to argue about it. So it's not really some kind of uh, wise prediction. All right. Uh, I urge you to adhere to what you know of my sunnah and the path of the rightly guided caliphs, uh, khulafa, and cling stubbornly to it. And you must obey, even if your leader is an Abyssinian leader. I want to comment on this part in Arabic. That was the tangent that started my tangent right here. It says, وَعَلَيْكُمْ uh, بِالطَّاعَةِ Following, uh, it's implied here, your leader. Uh, it says, even if they are a slave, a, a habashi, and what is modern day Ethiopia, an Ethiopian slave. And that word habashi is, is used a lot in a lot of hadith, and it is synonymous with black. And often the word slave, eh, not all slaves were black, but there's a lot of um, correlation there, unfortunately. So this here is to tell you not to trust these translations all the time. They omitted the part that said slave, and they just put Abyssinian. So it seems like, oh, the people of that uh, area. What he was meaning to say is, even if it's if it's a black slave who's leading you, as long as he's leading you uh, as a as a Khalifa, as long as he's following my Sunnah and whatnot, you need to follow him. And you could interpret it as, see, Muhammad was telling us no racism. Like even even if someone is is black and they're a leader, you should follow them. No, what, what he's doing is, in, in my opinion, he is putting Islam above people's biases, basically, is what he wants to say. Uh, do what he says, even if, even if he's an Ethiopian slave. And again, one of the, um, the problems with that is, why mention slave at all? If he is a Khalifa, he's not a slave. It's one or the other. So what does a person's ethnicity and them being a previous slave or not even a previous slave, he's described as a slave. What does that have to do with anything? Unless he's using all of these in a derogatory associated way. Slave, Ethiopian. And then he says, for the true believer, okay, this one is such a self-own, guys. For the true believer is like a camel with a ring in its nose. Wherever it is driven, it complies. <laughs> Wake up, sheeple. <laughs> well, he's just straight up saying is you are cattle you the good believer is cattle you just have to go wherever you're told that's not my words that's his and then we have sheikh saying you use your rationality what rationality Achi? what cattle uses, uses rationality the only rationality cattle uses is this dog is barking at me or this stick is coming from this direction so i'm going to walk in the other direction and that all that's basically at the core of islam a stick either a stick with a carrot on it, that's Jannah, or a stick he's going to beat you with. 
perpetually forever. Let's read this comment. When one doubts terribly, there is sympathetic talk of shaitan challenging them. When one leaves, there is scornful dismissiveness of them as a person. 100%. 100%. All right. So if you don't think that uh, this Ethiopian slave connection it has something to it, here's another tangent. So here's a hadith where, let me just read it. Um, a slave came to the uh, to give the pledge to the Prophet, so basically join Islam or uh, for Hijra, so to go with him from, uh, actually I'm not sure which Hijra this was, from uh, Mecca to Medina or Medina to Mecca. Um, he did not realize that he was a slave, so his the Prophet didn't realize that he was a slave. So his master came to get him and the Prophet said, sell him to me. So he purchased him for two black slaves. Then he would not pledge to him from anyone, um, so basically he didn't sell the slave anymore. Why is it noteworthy that he bought him for two black slaves? Now, I know what the defense of this is going to be um, because I tried to find the defense of this. And first of all, Muslims are going to say, well, the prophet didn't say it's because they're black slaves. It's the, it's the narrator saying it. Okay, what does that say about the prophet's uh, narrators, his sahaba, the people who carried on his, his legacy, his uh, hadith, the hadith that we used to translate to, to understand the Quran? What does it say of them? is that on some level, at least, this person was racist because what is the relevance of them being black? And I looked into the explanation and the sheikhs or or scholars are basically saying it could have been because the owner is a kafir and the prophet doesn't want a Muslim slave to go back to a kafir because either it's not allowed or it's not good. Um, But also they're saying it could be that the other slaves, the black slaves, were not Muslims. So it is outright said a Muslim is worth more than a non-Muslim. Be it in the afterlife, that's obvious. But in this life, there's so many point, things that point to Islam being absolutely Muslim supremacist. So I don't understand how how there's demands of... of anyway, like, for example, they say that the worth of one uh, Muslim slave is obviously more than the non-Muslim slaves, and that's why the Prophet did it. Or because the Prophet wanted more Muslims, so that's why he traded two. So he gave two slaves to someone who, if the prophet is a good slave owner and he's very fair and whatnot, someone who likely might be a worse slave owner than himself. He gave up two just to to get one more Muslim. And we go back to the point, why is the blackness mentioned at all? Why aren't these stories complete enough that they're not suspicious? Because if they're all suspicious, there's something to some of them at least. Let's see what note I took down about this. So... Yeah, and the obedience part is, is, is hilarious to me in the previous hadith. Um, yeah, and, and about the, the worth of a Muslim being more than a, than a non-Muslim, there's um, the concept of a dhimmi, so um, non-Muslim who pays jizya um, and stays in the Muslim land, sharia law, run land. They pay an extra tax to be allowed to live there, and then they have some rights. They're still not as much rights as Muslims, but they're not as little rights as slaves and not as little rights as non-Muslims, I suppose, or wandering through or something. And there's a hadith that I talked about in a video. I might put it up here um, later when, when I upload this. Uh, it's about a, a Jewish slave who used to disparage the prophet, so say bad things about him behind his back. He hadn't even like heard of it. And her owner um, killed her. And then the prophet found out the next day she was murdered and he said, who did this? And the owner explained, she used to call you names and stuff, so I killed her. And the prophet said, oh, okay, no retaliation payable for her blood. And the explanations say it's because um, she was a dhimmi or, or a slave uh, as well. And a slave's life is not worth as much as a free person's life. So you can't give up, like you can't punish someone by killing them for killing their own slave because your slave is your property. And also the, the, the part that stood out to me more was when she disparaged the prophet, she became a kafira, and a kafir's life is not worth anything. So if that isn't damning, I don't know what is. So what else? So um, yeah, another thing is in some of these explanations I found, let me just put them up here for someone who wants to read because I'm not sure which part was which, but I'll scroll through it real quick. In um, one of these explanations I saw that it was talking about, it's, it's under the book of... Um, buying and selling uh, slaves here and someone was talking about how this is to show the permissibility of trading two slaves for one 
there's so much in Islam that's down to the, it, it's such a totalitarian system that sometimes Muslims demand because of such fear of going to hell. Can I do this? Is this allowed? Is there precedent for this? Like, please tell me what the prophet did. So in this case, uh, it, it shows the permissibility of uh, trading two slaves for one. And I also got to ask when people ask this question here, um, the answers, instead of focusing on, no, 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 the prophet wasn't racist. Um, they go on and on and on about how the prophet didn't actually instill slavery. He was the freer of slaves. What? <laughs> he was the freer of slaves? Just in, the, in this hadith, the prophet didn't sell that slave. It, and, and the hadith even says, um, to the point that, well, this one, uh, to the point that um, people would ask him, is he, sla is he a slave or is he free? Because they didn't know because he had him for so long. It doesn't explicitly say that he sold him, but um, they, they make it seem as if, as if the prophet ended slavery when it was still around till the 1970s, Islamically. So the amount of butt kissing that they do to answer the question is, is disgusting. And also... <laughs> One oh, one of these answers, I'm, I'm going to put all the links in, in the comments because I can't find which one exactly. But it was talking about um, this teaches us, yeah, this, this kind of ruling goes for all. This word means, now it means animals. But at the time it meant something with a, with a haya, with, with a life basically. So they weren't, call, they weren't saying that's the ruling for all animals, but they're saying a category that includes animals. So they're just talking about buying and selling and slavery in such a casual way. And then they have the audacity to say Islam was here to end slavery. It, it was here to legitimize slavery in many ways. And what was the last thing I wanted to say about that? Yeah. Yeah. So now we know you can get a two for one deal, apparently, if, uh, if that's what you want to do with your slaves. And if you're not convinced that there's some racist undertones here, or at least it's suspicious, there's this hadith here. Um, you might have heard of it. The prophet said, listen and obey your chief, even if an Ethiopian whose head is like a raisin were made your chief. And that is a description of the hair on their head and how their heads look like raisins. I looked into the explanation of that as well, and I read that he was just describing them for the people as if people didn't understand what a habashi was. <laughs> and again, he keeps harping on this point, even if it's a, if it's a black leader. And the point he's trying to make is, uh, is not that black people are equal to, uh, to Arabs or, or anything like that. I, I don't think so. He's saying Islam is more important than, than color. He's not saying humans are equal. It, you might hear stuff about all humans are equal in the eyes of Allah, but <laughs> is it really when they use the word uh, slave and habashi and and, and and like they're all just often used next to each other and what is the point of describing the way that his head looks now some people might say that's just non-pc but it's not like very bad okay let's just let's just presume that to, in today's world we understand that it's hurtful didn't muhammad or allah have the foresight to see that this one day was going to be problematic <laughs> like that the the we're get, like the woke movement i suppose is going to come for him or something because it's not just about over exaggerating a response to this. This is actually hurtful. Why would you need to describe them at all? And if you really believe that Muhammad just it had nothing to do with their looks, then why did he say it? Tangentially, here's something else. Uh, the last thing I promise. This hadith right here. The prophet delivered a sermon. Then he made mention of women and... Uh, exhorted the men concerning them. Then he said, how long will one of you whip his wife like a slave and then lie with her at the end of the day? Okay, so many things in this hadith. First of all, he's saying that the interpretation that some ulama today are, are taking is, he's saying don't beat your wife that hard. Aside from the problem that Islam allows beating wives in certain situations and this and that, this this should like... This should really make you think about it. He didn't say, don't whip your wife. He didn't say that at all. He said, don't whip her like a slave. And then at the end of the day, sleep with her. Like, you can understand it as if, if you beat her, she needs some time. Like, don't be insensitive enough to sleep with her at the same night, even though he did so with the wife of someone that he killed in one of his wars. Um, and that was, he, he allowed it for, for his, his warrior friends to uh, marry um, 
the wives of the widows of, of the people who they just killed. But more problematic here is why is he using the example of whipping a slave? People will say, well, because people whip their slave back then, and there's this other hadith where the Prophet said, oh, you need to be good to your slave. But why is he using it as an example? He could use this as a teaching moment and be like, oh, by the way, don't whip your slaves either. Not, not say, hey, don't whip your wives too hard as much as you would whip a slave. And then in another context, be like, eh, whipping slaves is not, it's not the best thing to do. Like there's a hadith where he says uh, that people who, who beat their wives, husbands who beat their wives, that's, they're not the best of people. Oh, thanks for the, the, the amazing condemnation by saying they're not the best of people. Is that, is that the best you could do? <laughs> they're not sending their best. Couldn't he have said, don't beat your wife at all? And couldn't Allah have used the word that doesn't also meet, mean beat as a primary meaning? So this really uh, puzzled me that after all this, people don't see the issues of, of what Muhammad said and did. He, um, he wanted you to follow Islam so bad, he would concede that like Muslims should concede to a black leader with a raisin-looking head. Um, I urge black people to really rethink how their ancestors became, uh, became Muslim and why they are still Muslim now. And of course, you're always going to hear that... Uh, the prophet had a slave who, who I, his name escapes me right now, uh, who later became um, an imam in, in the masjid. Okay, that's the exception, not the rule. Uh, let's see what else. Yeah, I think that concludes what I had to say about this. There's a lot of, you know, trying to explain it. Oh, there's also this. In this website, islamweb.net, which obviously does not uh, represent Islam at all, um, in the explanation of this hadith, it's talking about how, oh, but the prophet said, beat her in non-excruciating be beating. And that means you can never deny that the verse says uh, beat. Yeah, it was, it was Bilal, right? Thank you for that. Bilal was the, was the slave that uh, became an imam, basically. In this website, they're, first of all, they're saying, no, no, the prophet said, don't beat her hard. That's what he was trying to insinuate. Well, thank you. How very generous of you. Um, and then I see this right here. I don't recognize this. This doesn't look like any uh, style of hadith or, or verse. So I look it up and I think it is a uh, part of um, old Arab poetry. And it says, uh, The slave, nothing um, nothing stops him or, or controls him or something along those lines, except for the stick. So why? Why is this quoted on islamweb.net? That's what I want to understand. Why aren't Muslims up in arms about this, saying, hey, stop representing us like this? Why is this quoted on an Islamic website at all if there aren't undertones of allowing slavery and beating your slaves? Just beat your wife a little less hard. Um, I know we're getting a little off topic here, but yeah, and, and then they talk about how the man is responsible financially like to, to pay for, for his wife and everything unless she disobeys and then that kind of goes away and she has to give back her mother and whatnot. I, I don't understand. I don't understand why like they're, they're quoting these verses about beating uh, slaves, but it is what it is. Anyway, that concludes <laughs> what started uh, as me reacting to, uh, to Yasser Qadi's um, asinine take on why people leave religion and his um, casual, uh, I don't know, a third of the time that he spent talking about uh, child marriage, which is, is kind of damning. Like, why would you bring that up? <laughs> why would you bring that up? Because you know, you know that people are going to talk about this. You know, it's on people's minds. Anyway, thank you for bearing with me <laughs> for this long. Uh, thanks for watching. And I urge you, please, to think critically. Wait, don't log off. Think critically and think for yourself. And when I used to say that, um, I meant think for yourself as in like think individually, like do some of the thinking for yourself. Of course, consult the people who are wiser than you, who know more than you, but don't leave it at that. But I also realized today there's, there's a double meaning to it. Think for yourself as in for your own sake, for your own benefit, think. For, for your own well-being, think about what you believe. Think about everything. I'm not, I'm not just saying religion. If you believe, for example, that a certain political system is better than another, don't just leave it at that. Think about it for your own sake. So 
think critically, think for yourself. Thanks for watching.